Well, I'm very happy that Corey Gardner talked about the importance of grassroots and the importance of creative partnerships and that he said our water is worth finding solutions for because I'm going to briefly tell you about a group of yourselves who has been working to try to do just that, to build a grassroots creative partnership in order to find water solutions um, for, for your area. Thank you, Deb. Um, the issue that this group came around on is after compliance, now where? As uh, you heard this morning, getting to compliance is hard enough, but even once you get to compliance, there's still a very sizable amount of pumping that's happening that is creating an annual uh, lack of, of, um, of water, an out of balance situation. So when the Republican River Water Conservation District did a survey, um, which I believe the results were made um, public just one year ago, March of 2013, the, um, okay. the response was, uh, yes, people did want to see water conservation happen, and they wanted to see water conservation beyond um, the compliance issue. But the big concern is how. How do we do that? Um, so out of that survey came um, the Republican River Water Conservation District said, you know, we want to pull together people from all the groundwater management districts to talk about this situation, to talk about what the survey showed, and to uh, see if there isn't something that we could do to work together to move forward. Um, so they, they um, had a dialogue, and out of that dialogue, they actually did come up with some decisions moving forward. I'm going to um, share with you some of what the dialogue uh, was all about, and I'm going to turn this way so I can kind of look at it at the same time. Here are some of the things that came out of that dialogue, and I've made sure that I had a good um, range of, of things that were said. Um, today's the day that we have to start the long-term conservation discussion. We have to bring everything to the table that we possibly can. Uh, another person said leadership is needed to find strategies that work for the whole, strategies that are fair across the districts. It may require asking people to make short-term economic sacrifices for long-term gain. Um, what we are now doing is not sustainable. One person said, should we set a real goal for actual reduction and a timeline attached to it? Another person said, rules would be easier to swallow if you knew the neighbor up the road wasn't breaking them. Uh, someone said, we won't come up with complete harmony, but we have to capture the areas where we can come to agreement. Um, someone said, pushing water conservation is a lot like putting your baby in the car seat. It's not something you really want to do, and at first you resist it, but after a while, you get used to it. Someone said, it's better for us to come up with our own plan instead of the state mandating us. And several people said, grassroots is the only way we can do this. Um, the, the idea came up, we need to get some hydrologists to tell us how much we need to reduce pumping in order to sustain the aquifer for X number of years. Someone else said, farmers will pay attention to economics a lot more than they'll pay attention to a feel-good conservation. And someone else put it a little differently, we won't voluntarily conserve. We have to have an economic ramification. And another said it right where I think most people believe it. It'll probably require regulations and restrictions, but I wish it didn't. The idea of pay for what you use is going to be a hard sell for those who have plenty of water. But eventually, the farmers with plenty of water are going to be in the same boat. Their leadership is needed to help their counterparts see the benefits. 
Another said, we need to raise the question within our respective groundwater management districts whether there is support for limiting water use. We don't know about that support until we have the dialogue. This one is fun. A lot of people said, we have to take baby steps. And an equally large number of people said, we don't have time for baby steps. Time's running out. We have an hourglass, but instead of sand in it, it has water. So out of that, there were some decisions made. So that was one meeting. It was a dynamic meeting. Reagan Wascom, my supervisor at Colorado State University, who directs the Colorado Water Institute, was there with me. And we were very impressed with the passion that was in the room, the feeling of respect for one another, whether or not you agreed in each other's ideas, the, the understanding of the people in that room that we have to do something, and we've got to be creative, and we've got to put our um, put in some elbow grease here and figure out what to do. Before the day was over, there were some decisions made. One was that the group wanted to develop an overriding intensive education campaign throughout the basin, and that they wanted to learn for, from others who are going through the same thing, whether it's in other basins or other states. They decided they wanted to come up with hard numbers to show people where, uh, where you're headed if you don't have conservation. And most importantly, in my view, they decided they wanted to form a steering committee to organize and move forward with these ideas. And at that point, I will remember, I take a little credit for this, because I remember at that point, everybody was saying, yeah, we need to do that. And I said, and what will be the meeting date of this group? And um, Deb is, and Dennis Coriel and Steve Kramer all nodding their heads. They decided they were gonna set it up for September, and they did. And at the September meeting, they decided that that they were going to have one member from each of the groundwater management districts, not just the seven that are within the Republican River Water Conservation District, but, but those that are in the northern high plains, um, which would include East Cheyenne. So those eight groundwater management districts were all represented at that first meeting in September, 100% attendance. And then they had one member from CAPA and one member from the uh, Republican River Water Conservation District. So a total of 10 members, 100% attendance. And at that meeting, they chose a name. Now they chose a very long name, and it took me two months to memorize it, and then after that two months was over, they shortened it, thank goodness. They first called it the Northern High Plains Water Conservation Preservation Partnership. But then they decided that was too much for anyone to say, so now it's called the Water Preservation Partnership. And then the second line that you can fill in the blank if you want to is of the Northern High Plains of Colorado. So you can call it the Water Preservation Partnership, and that's what I hope most of you will call it, because then you'll talk about it more often than if you have to say that much longer name. They came up with a mission at that first meeting. And again, I've worked with many groups trying to resolve conflict about water, trying to come up with water solutions. It's very unusual for a group to come up with a mission statement in one meeting. And they said they wanted to work together to preserve, for as long as possible, the underground water resources we share in common. Very simple, very straightforward, but actually very profound. They made uh, some consensus statements they wanted people to, to absorb, and that was that every groundwater district must take responsibility to make sure every well permit holder is in compliance with their permit, and that we request the assistance of the state in consistently enforcing well permit compliance. 
Then they made some more decisions. Yes, we do need an educational campaign and we need a logo for that. And they started working on a logo. We need to show people what the problem is in no uncertain terms. We need some sort of a water balance analysis. And then they said, we need to involve the communities, not just ag, but we're better off if we start with ag. This is not just an ag problem. It's going to affect all of our communities, but let's start with ag. Then the next step, the, the next four months, um, and this group has moved very fast, and, but very steadily at the same time. They had a presentation from Jim Slatter, Slattery, not diff, much different from what you saw today, except that now he has taken it further into a groundwater basin management by um, district uh, view, which helps to look at these, these uh, water balance issues district by district. And, and by looking at that, they realized they already have the water balance analysis. And they showed what Jim has to a CSU professor emeritus of engineering, and she agreed that what you've already got as a water balance is plenty. You've got the water balance information. It's a matter of educating about it, and then, um, and then they decided that what was would be most helpful, rather than a water balance study that's already been accomplished, is to have an economic study. And they began talking with a CSU professor, who you're going to hear from in a few minutes, about doing um, a study that would help you guys understand what policies could we choose from that would help us make decisions about how we could prolong the life of the aquifer and do the best that we can to make the most of our economic potential. Um, if, if we know that we can't keep pumping the water to this extent and not have it run out, what are our choices? Do we want to pump a lot now and, and uh, take advantage of commodity prices and then, and then not have something to leave? Or do we want to stretch it out? And if we want to stretch it out, over what period of time? And if in stretching it out, we look at some other things like how um, we might improve uh, some of the methods that we're using, perhaps that will help. So. Um, um, this economic study will answer some of those questions. And not just for economic effects on ag producers, but also economic effects on your communities. So um, another thing that they decided is they're ready to begin launching an educational campaign. So the next point is that a need to search for funding. So the plan is um, to put in a proposal to the South Platte Basin Roundtable for funds for this economic study. And that couldn't start until probably late fall. And then the other thing is that they want to start the educational campaign earlier than that. And this would be a general education campaign to take out to your communities and to take out to your individual groundwater management districts to share this information about the challenge. And so um, the idea is that they would seek funding from the groundwater management districts, their own districts, as well as perhaps some community uh, businesses or community organizations to fund this educational campaign. So here we have both the problem and the challenge. We have the opportunity to come together, as um, Corey Gardner said, to, to bring our voices together, to come up with some creative solutions, and to work on behalf of the water that we all depend on here in the Republican River. And I want to share with you the names of the people who are doing this work. Um, for, the, for WY, we have Denny Salvador. For Central Yuma, we have Marvin Pletcher. For the Arikari, we have Kenny Helling. We have Gil Anderson from Marks Butte. Stephen Pekin, Meekins from Frenchman, Grant Bledsoe from Sand Hills, Tim Paltler from Plains, uh, Scott Smith from East Cheyenne, and then of course we have Steve Kramer representing the Conservation Committee of the 
Republican River Water Conservation District, and then we have Joe Newton from Kappa. So this group is working hard to bring all of you together to see what we might do in terms of creating a creative partnership to um, try to come up with some solutions for these problems.